Shivaya Om Namo Shivaya Om Namaste Well, we're starting with this new series, which is going to be quite extensive because Shiva Purana is a big, big book. And I wanted to add the insights as a separate video so that if you want, you can just listen to the story uh, one chapter at a time. So let's take a look at the first two chapters of the Mahatmyam. Mahatmyam means the glorification, like uh, an introduction to the Purana. All the Puranas have it right in the beginning. And it may sound like, almost like hype or marketing talk, but it's actually very, very deep because in the very first couple of shlokas, the questions are asked that determine the course of the entire work. Let's take a look at that in the first chapter. Shonaka asks Sutta Goswami, and this is at the close of the thousand year sacrifice at Naimisharanya, uh, during which the 18 major Puranas were all narrated by Sutta. So here now he's coming to the climax and narrating the Shiva Purana, which is just like Shiva is the Supreme God. Shiva Purana is the Supreme Purana. It may not be the longest one, but it sure is the deepest one. It's completely compatible with Advaita, which is the actual Vedic philosophy given in the four Vedas and the Upanishads based on them. So then he asks these really deep, important questions. Now let's take a look at what they are. First of all, he says, Please narrate to me the essence of the Puranas in detail. Remember, they've just had a thousand year sacrifice and they've heard all the other Puranas. So now, what is the essence of these Puranas? What is the actual meaning, the quintessence, the core, the heart, the root of all these Vedic histories? And then he asks, how do good conduct, good devotion, and power of discrimination flourish? Because it's Kali Yuga, and people are losing their intelligence. They're not able to discriminate anymore between right and wrong. They're being misled by false leaders because all the qualified kings were killed in the battle of Kurukshetra. So the rogues and thieves took over the administrative posts in the government, and we see that still today. The governments uh, or are facilitating, rather, the extraction of all the wealth from the people and transferring it into their cronies. So this is basically <laughs> robbery, and it's been going on for a long time now, and uh, it's not about to stop. You're going to see... This is the theme of Kali Yuga, cheating the people in the name of government. So he's asking, how do we, in spite of this, how do we develop good conduct and discrimination? How are base feelings dispelled by good men? Because in this bad association in Kali Yuga, even the best men are going to have bad feelings. In fact, because there are no good association available, the best men are going to be very disturbed. They're not going to be able to find compatible association or community. Then he says, in this terrible Kali age, all living beings have become almost demoniac. Almost? <laughs> no, they're out and out, straight up demoniac. So then, what is the effective method of remedying this? If there is any effective method, it's simply by hearing the essence of Vedic truth from someone who has realized it. That's why we do these videos. 
Unfortunately, there are many pretenders who are just giving the theoretical knowledge without practical realization. So we have to compete with them, or rather they compete with us and try to drown us out. But those who are sincere will find this association by inner guidance. Then tell me about the greatest means to achieve the most perfect wheel, the holiest of the holy modes. Wheel means welfare. In fact, the word welfare comes from the word wheel, the old English word. So then how do we get this benefit? If the traditional paths of religion and austerity and renunciation are blocked off by the bad association and other evils of the age of Kali, then how do we get the actual benefit of Vedic knowledge? And finally, he asks, what is that the practice of which particularly purifies the soul? And how can a man of unsullied mind, in other words, a pure devotee, how can he attain Shiva? So all these questions are discussed in this Purana. And in the next section, he says that there are the three stages of bhakti, by body, mind, and words. The uh, bhakti, by means of the body, means rites, rituals, and other practices done with the body, karma yoga. With the uh, words, he means prayers and contemplation on the good qualities of the god and goddess. This is bhakti. It's done with words. And finally, with the mind, meditation is performed, leading to complete self-realization. So all these methods are discussed extensively in this Purana. And we'll see how extensively. <laughs> I mean, really, there's nothing uh, left unsaid or uh, undiscussed in this Purana. It gives all the details of all the ancient rites. So now let's move along and let's look at the second chapter. The second chapter is about Devaraj. Now, Devaraj means the king of the gods, and that's the name of Shiva. It's in his thousand names, for example. And it also gives his position. Yes, there are many gods, beginning with Vishnu, Brahma, Indra, and so on. But the god of the gods is Shiva. He's the one they turn to when they get in trouble. <laughs> Either Shiva or Shakti, depending on the situation. So Deva Deva, or Adi Deva, or in this case Deva Raj, the king of the Devas, is Shiva. So here's this Brahman. A fallen Brahmin. <laughs> my glasses just fell off my knee. <laughs> and he's a fallen Brahmin. He's not following the Dharma, even though he was born in a so called Brahmin family. He doesn't have the Brahminical knowledge or skills or activities. In fact, he's completely devoid of Brahminical qualities. He's such a rascal. He's doing everything wrong. <laughs> but he has one great advantage, his name. Because every time he hears his name, beginning from infancy, his mother's calling him, hey, Devaraj, come here. Devaraj, eat your dinner. Devaraj, wash your face. Devaraj, it's time to go to bed. You know how mothers are always calling the children's name. And the father and the other relatives. And then in school, all his life, he's heard. Devaraj, 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 applied to himself. So you see, this is one of the secret, powerful principles of Vedic spiritual life that actually helps people uh, regain their purity 
if it's lost, or if it's not lost, to increase it and develop it further. And this is why the Diksha name, the initiation name, is given as a name of God. And of course, the Vedic conclusion, the Upanishadic com conclusion, is that tattvamasi, you are it, <laughs> you are that, you are Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. That's the only way to explain consciousness, that consciousness is the supreme, but simply reflected in the limited mind and body of a living being. So, if that's the case, then it's very appropriate to name people by names of God. And the merit or the shubha karma, the good karma accrued from this practice is incalculable. I mean, how many thousands and millions of times have we heard our own name? So if our name is, you know, like my name, Adya Shakti, uh, it's composed of two words, Adi, meaning the original, and Shakti, meaning power. So when they combine, the Adi becomes Adya. Adya Shakti means the original power of God. And she is the supreme Shakti from which all other Shaktis descend. So every time I hear my name, it reminds me of her. And as a result, her image and her form and her nature actually has become deeply embedded in my psyche. So I know from experience that this is a very powerful practice. So in other words, Devaraj, even though he was such a rascal, by simply hearing a tiny excerpt from Shiva Purana, actually by accident, <laughs> actually by divine arrangement, huh? this was his good karma bearing fruit. So we see that even a fallen rascal who's done everything wrong, he can go to a temple and by divine arrangement or by accident, by chance, whenever the scientists don't know something, they call it chance. <laughs> they don't really understand, so they just analyze it statistically. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> So, scientists are cheaters. Anyway, when one gets this blessing. Now, I have a theory which has so far proven true in the lives of all the people I know in my life, that at least once in everyone's life, they get the opportunity to hear the truth. And if they receive that and honor it and act on it, they get salvation. So here, this fallen Brahmin, I mean, he's really such a rascal, murdered his own mother and father and his own wife just to feed his habit of uh, this prostitute. Uh, by chance, he's in this city and he hears some narration of Shiva Purana from a realized soul. And because of this, he then contracted an acute fever. If this is not an ordinary disease, this is purification. So with the echo of hearing the Shiva Purana in his ears, he comes down with this severe fever and in a few days he's dead. And even though the Yamadutas, the agents of Lord Yamaraj, try to take him and take him to Yama, Yama's city, the Shiva Dutas come and take him back. Huh? And so this is the result of hearing even a little bit of the authentic scriptures from a realized soul. So this whole series represents an opportunity to hear from Sutta Goswami. Now, some peoples like the, the Vaishnavas say that Sutta Goswami was the result of uh, Anuloma, which means a marriage of a higher caste man and a lower caste woman. 
But actually, Sutta Goswami was a highly elevated soul, a disciple, a direct disciple of Vyasadeva, who divided the Vedas. That's what Vyas means, divider. And he knew all the Puranas. He was able to present them, speaking from memory. So the days when someone could remember all these things so clearly are long gone. This is how fallen we become in Kali Yuga. But fortunately, all these talks were written down. And by taking sincere shelter of them and hearing them with faith, one can easily become purified and approach the highest destination of perfect self-realization. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti. Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.